You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I do think there's going to be some gains in the silver price. I do think there's a bull market here, uh, but you know I wouldn't necessarily bet on a return to a, a gold-silver ratio of uh, 30 to 1 as we hit in 2011. Welcome to Mining Stock Education. My name is Brian Lenny. Today with me, I have Keith Wiener, CEO of Monetary Metals. In our conversation today, you are going to hear Keith's view on the Fed's current interest rate policy, the Bank of Japan's rate hike, CBDCs, the economics of net carbon zero emissions, and where he thinks precious metals prices are headed in 2024. Keith, it's great to have you. Let's start with the Fed's interest rate decision from last week. They decided to leave rates unchanged. My question for you is if you foresee a scenario where the Fed pivots in policy without a major catalyst. I guess two parts of that question. Pivot in policy, yes. Without a major catalyst, um, I think unlikely. Um, you know, that said, I try to, you know, confine my opinions and my analysis to uh, what I call monetary science and stay out of, uh, you know, politics. I think politics is fundamentally unpredictable. You, you know, they say politics means make strange bedfellows. You get strange, uh, you know, alignments. You know, we have an election coming up, all these things. Um, you know, it's, you know, Jay Powell is a Trump appointee, right? So is he going to want the economy to be sour headed into the election because this nominee is Republican? I, I don't try to analyze that stuff because I think it's fundamentally unpredictable. Things can swing in a lot of different ways. But what I, what I can say is that the marginal debtor is, is um, you know, it's, it's completely getting squeezed by this environment. And so there will be a crisis. And when the crisis happens, I think the Fed will react to it and maybe be proactive. I mean, I think, you know, if you, if you look at the, what the Fed is saying today and look at how, we, how they think today, they would say that the Fed of 2007, 2008 was asleep at the switch. That the, they, would, they would castigate their, you know, some case, same people, in some cases it's their predecessors, they would castigate them and say, you know, you people were asleep at the switch, you missed this thing, look at the crisis that you allowed to happen on your on your watch. And so the Fed today, I, I've characterized as like hyper proactive. They're looking for the slightest sign of whatever, and they want to tamp it down um, and not be, uh, uh, you know, sa- so sanguine as, as the Fed was back in those days. So they may not be so much reacting to a full-blown crisis as reacting to the early edges of that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, an incipient crisis is what's gonna. Well, I mean, if, if it does, the Fed doesn't pivot before that, then an incipient crisis will cause a pivot. Right. In, in Powell's press conference, he did touch on the importance of the the labor force, and and I guess alluding to unemployment. So, do you think something like that, like a a, a rise in unemployment, could be that spur that 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 you say makes them react beforehand? Well, I'll say two things about that. One is. You know, everything in politics is sloganeering. Uh, I forget who was said that, you know, said there's a stated reason and there's a real reason for everything that happens in politics. So, you know, the Fed is officially, I and mean, this is the law, tasked with um, inflation and unemployment. Those are the two means. Uh, I think the Fed does not give a beep about um, employment or unemployment. And as similarly about um, the stock market or GDP, uh, or anything like that recession. They care about the solvency of their client banks. That's it. Now, of course, that solvency depends on the ability of people to, to pay and service their debts. So if you have, you know, 10 million, you know, newly unemployed people that can't make their car or truck payments, that's obviously not good for the banks. So the Fed cares about that in an indirect sense. But the other thing I'll say is that unemployment is downstream of something else, and that something else is credit and what's happening with credit at the margin and that's that's ultimately what the fed is concerned with uh now i think in a lot of cases they you know they get the theory wrong you know they're, they're working counter to their own purposes but that's what they i think that's what motivates them so it's a credit event of some sort um so on our, on our own podcast we did a um whole uh whole month for october so basically in honor of halloween and we called it zombie month. 
So I, I love this term zombie, right? This is not some lunatic fringe of the internet. This is the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, defines a zombie corporation. You know, there's a couple of other stipulations, but basically profits are less than interest expense. So it can't even pay the interest. It can't even service the debt, let alone amortize it. And um, at that time, this was pre-rate hikes, several months before the Fed began hike. So interest rates were nominally zero. Um, at that time, 20% of all the corporate debt that was out there was zombie debt. Um, so by hiking rates from zero to five and a half percent, they've obviously increased, um, you know, the percentage. I haven't seen data yet that really is sort of post rate hike to know just how bad that is. But something tells me it's probably half or more of all that out there is zombie debt, which means all of that is added to default. The only question is when. So part of it is when does it mature? Part of it is what other games are playing to ensure that somebody is there still bidders on that debt. Um, right. So if you look at the spread between junk bonds and treasury bonds, and so a lot of people will look at JNK as an ETF and TLT as a treasury bond ETF and plot the spread between the two. What you'll see is uh, it's the Sherlock Holmes story of the dog that did not bark in the night. It isn't, it should be blowing out the spread right now. It should be going bananas. It isn't. So when does it, when does that start to happen? And, um, you know, I, th I think that's, you know, if not impossible to predict, certainly very, very, very difficult. And um, you know, I don't know if anybody has a good prediction on that. Right. Uh, also in that press conference, I found it interesting. Powell, um, he sort of, to me, was trying to paint a picture. He said that he doesn't foresee 0% interest rates again in the future for the U.S. He said, you know, they'll probably go down, but we won't see 0% again. And so I guess it's a binary question for you. But <laughs> what do you think? Do you agree with him? So um, I'll, I'll share a personal anecdote. Um, as, as I was developing my theory of interest in prices, this was back in maybe 2014, I'm trying to remember. And I was at a monetary policy conference put on by the Cato Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, and I've been struggling with the concept of like a black hole, you, you know, the singularity of zero interest rates at the center, which you know, and um, struggle with this idea that, you know, if you're in this rocket ship, hypothetically, as long as you don't get as far as the, you know, you're coming into the, the black hole, there's a, there's there's this radius, the event horizon. And as long as you stay outside the event horizon, at least in theory, you could turn your rocket motors on and point that way and get out. I mean, the gravity could be so enormously strong that, you know, your rocket may not be strong enough. But once you get inside the event horizon, it's theoretically impossible at least according to the current physical physics theories anyways. I don't struggle with this idea of like as the interest rate falls, there's there's a non-zero point of the event horizon. Once you get inside of it, you, you know, you can jitter around a little bit, but you can never um you never escape out. Anyway, so that was that was what was puzzling in the back of my mind, just trying to think about this. And there was like three speakers in a row. And you know, the Cato policy Monetary policy conference interesting because they get current and former like Fed governors and, and you know they had Dick Fisher and you know some interesting people as well as they had John Taylor Taylor Rule um, who's at uh, I don't know what to Stanford I think I don't trying to remember where he teaches anyways so they had you know they had him and they had two Fed guys like one retired Fed guy and I think one current Fed, current Fed guy and all three of them were saying I just don't know why. It, it was clear they all they were all reading out of the same playbook. It's a monetarist playbook, and uh, you know it was a, sort of a variant of the Taylor. Um, they all had the same playbook, and according to that playbook, the Fed should have hiked rates, whatever it was, twenty five basis points, you know, three to six months prior. Jeez, I don't know why Chairman Bernanke, um, you know, didn't hike rates, and then as, as three of them were basically musing over the same thing and just really struggled. Oh, why well, he's not doing this? That's when it clicked. It's because he can't. And he's terrified. And so even people that are in his, these are not his inner circle people, but these were like middle circle. I mean, this is like the, you know, board of governors. Um, even people in his middle circle are not being told because he's terrified that the thing is falling, nothing he can do. So every once in a while, they play at it. You, you know, it's, it's, it's like a cat toying with it. You know, they sort of, makes this pretext or pretense of, 
um, yeah, you know, we're going to hike interest rates and whatever, but it keeps gravity keeps, you know, reasserting itself stronger. And so, yeah, we're going to see zero interest rates again. Uh, and then so. It just uh, for for my prerogative, I, I look at the situation. I hear what you're saying. The event horizon that is a really good analogy to it. I wonder. I wonder though. Like I've looked at it in the past, and this is just my opinion. I thought, oh, this has to be the time where this kind of falls apart on them, where they can't, you know, move markets by what they speak. They're going to have to act, and they're eventually the, the house of cards has to fall. Um, but it seems like they've been able to kick the can down the road multiple times further than I would have ever guessed. So what is the significance of where we are today? Is this that moment where it it is like the gig is up or do you foresee them being able to kind of go further with this and just keep on lowering and raising rates as we move forward? You know, if there's one thing about all this, right? So I think around 20, 2012, I thought that there was five to seven years left. The whole system is going to blow up. And um, obviously, you know, here we are, 2024, and it hasn't. Right? So I was, you know, wrong by at least five years, uh, and and count it. Right? Uh, if there's a lesson to take it away from this, is that man, that can has a lot more kicks left in it than you possibly think. You know, or or to put it another way, they have more tricks up their sleeve than uh, you know than one might think. And maybe maybe a different way of putting at it in economic terms. Adam Smith said, "It's a great deal of ruin in the nation." And that basically you can create these ruined policies and you don't end up with a mass starvation and a revolution right away. I mean, it's inevitable, but not instant. And, you know, it can take quite a lot of time because there's quite a lot of accumulated capital and people are consuming capital, but how long does that take? And um, clearly longer than uh, I certainly thought in, in 2012. Um, how much longer? You know, it's very hard to say, but... Um, at least from the U.S. dollar perspective, you know the thing that's going to extend even longer than than one should think is, is possible is all the people and you know that are subject to all the rest of the currencies in the world will already are in, in the process of putting their capital into the dollar, and that process is first yet accelerate. And so the rest of the world, is, you know, the whole thing, the whole world is drowning. The rest of the world is going to be offering up and holding their precious capital above the waterline, pushing it into the dollar and so that's going to make the dollar stronger for longer um and and when i say that i don't mean against other currencies i i don't think you can measure the dollar in other currencies anyway they're all dollar derivatives uh but just holding the dollar up from utter collapse and utter wipeout um and, and that will postpone it a lot longer than um again than what you know than one might think or expect you know on the other side of the interest rate uh, th- uh uh, policy out there. The Bank of Japan raises rates by 0.1%, which I think is uh, their first uh, raise in 17 years. Um, I've heard that the BOG, BOJ's interest rate policy hike is one of the best indicators for a recession. And I saw a chart on social media that showed the BOJ and their decisions and how recession followed. What's your take on the move and how might it trickle down into the global economy? So, you know, the thing of the falling interest rate which was a distinct phenomenon from a too low interest rate. And so Japan basically had too low. I mean, it wasn't, I guess it wasn't falling for a long time. It was zero um, and, and held pegged that way. But the thing about a too low interest rate is that it pulls down the return on capital across every industry economy wide. Right. So if, if there's anything that exists anywhere in the economy that generates 10% return on capital, everybody will be borrowing unlimited free credit. To get into that business, I mean, more, let's say it's the hamburger business. For some reason, hamburgers are generating a 10% return on capital. Well, everybody and their uncle is now borrowing money to open up hamburger stores. Pretty soon, you're not getting 10% return on, on hamburgers anymore. Um, and you're going to pull it down. So there's an arbitrage between the cost of capital and the return on capital. Um, you know, and that's, that's basically about what businesses do. Um, and so, you know, if you hold interest rates at zero for a long period of time, you have an awful lot of, of you know, businesses in every sector whose return, you know, we're in debt up to their eyeballs, number one, and the return they're getting on the capital they've invested is barely above the debt service, you know, the payment, the VIG, if you want to call it that. Um, and that's, you know, and, and the Japanese economy is loaded up with that. Now do you want to raise interest rates? Well, yeah, there's going to be a crisis because now suddenly above every, everybody's underwater and you move up 
you move up the waterline by one meter, and everybody that was just a couple of millimeters above the waterline is now a meter minus a few millimeters below the waterline, and everyone's drowning. So um, I think, no, I, I, I want to be really careful not to convey the sense that I'm attempting to guide the central banks to a good or a right decision. I'm not trying to say that lower interest rates is good or right. I, I think they're in, uh, there's a German term that's used in, in uh, chess, Zugzwang, uh, which means every move, you know, what is it, C-U-G, C-W-A-N-G, right? So uh, I guess you'd say Zugzwang and, and, you know, with the American pronunciation of it. When basically every move you make is a bad one. You'd rather not make a move at all, but you, know, you don't have that choice. Um, you know, there's no good thing that they can do. Um, but if you hike interest rates, this will be the consequence, which I don't think there's any political will for it, even if it were right, which, it, which I don't argue that it is. There's no political will anyway. So, uh, you know, yeah, they think they're going to hike right now. And, and uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, that's cute. Um, you know, the Fed has stopped hiking, and they're they're trying to talk. You know, they're trying to talk the market at about the cut, uh, as, you, as you started off, you know, can, do they have to act as jawbone their way through policy? Well, right now they're trying the jawbone phase. And, uh, you know, as we know, historically, the jawbone phase only lasts so long. Um, and then you actually have to do something. The market's like, all right, put up, shut up. Um, and, and, and Japan thinks they're going to reverse it. It's interesting that the currency dropped on that news. Normally, right, the, the, the mainstream theory is that it's higher interest rates higher, that that should make that currency stronger. As it becomes more relatively attractive, the fact that it became less attractive is, is kind of interesting. In uh, previous gold reports that you put out for monetary metals, you talked about uh, the COVID lockdown and this theory of whiplash to prices. You know, I don't know. Arguably, we're a year and a half, two years after you know the COVID lockdowns, and cost of living still remains high. How do you look at the inflation that we're seeing in Canada, the U.S., and, and maybe mainly the West? Um, how do you explain where we are with the inflation right now? You know, I talk about several large non-monetary forces that drive prices up. And, you know, lockdown was a big one, right? We just said, okay, it's basically illegal or impossible to produce certain kinds of things. Um, and I remember, you know, there were meat shortages in the grocery stores in 2020, which is just like, wow, you know, this is not the third world, this is America. We don't have shortages. Well, it turned out, and, and everyone said, oh, you know, prices are skyrocketing. Well, prices of, you know, either live animals headed to slaughter or recently slaughtered animals collapsed. The farmers were being ruined. Um, and at the same time, the price of the grocery store was, was rising, which meant you had a widening spread. It's not that prices are overall up, i.e. the dollar going down. You had um, a widening spread. And, um, you know, a big part of my dissertation is devoted to this idea of what happens in an economy when coordination is improvement and that is spreads are narrowing? And what happens when the government, you know, messes it up? Spreads are widening. And then widening spread is a, is a measure of discoordination that the government has rendered impossible to coordinate. So you have these farmers that are producing livestock and uh, they want to bring it to market and you don't have a buyer because the government is just smashing the meat processing plants left and right. And, you know, and, and one guy, I'm exaggerating only slightly, but if one guy had a brother whose, whose daughter had a kid who had, you know, in a, in a kindergarten class where there's one kid with a runny nose, shut down the whole plant. And um, so, you know, massive plant closures. And so they didn't have any capacity to produce and they were buying, obviously, because they weren't able to process it and sell it in, in the supermarkets. Um, so, you know, massive source of rising prices. Of course, a lot of those farmers were, were wiped out. And so the production goes offline permanently at least until someone else borrows more money and uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. We put an asterisk on that. Someone else borrowing more money to, to recreate the capacity destroyed in the lockdown. Then then there's a whiplash as we as we unlock and especially combined with stimmy checks and other which is not monetary, it's fiscal. And then, you know, other things like eviction on, on private landlords, um I'm sorry, moratorium on private landlords affecting anybody and you know, and banks are foreclosing on anybody. And on a, and a holiday on student loans and all these things, um, so all of a sudden, it's like going to Amazon and buying more stuff, and um, but you know, all across the supply chain, you know, companies destroyed by lockdown 
aren't there anymore. And there's giant gaps. And, um, you know, we're still struggling with that. On top of that is the just sort of general relentless rise of what I call mandatory useless ingredients. So you think about gasoline, at least I don't know what they do in Canada, but it's mandatory to put in either ethanol or MBTE, um, at least during the summer. And so I, I thought, no, that's a perfectly, that's a useless ingredient. And I, I thought that was a, a good term for, for the whole thing. It's when the government forces you to put something into your product or service that the buyer doesn't value and usually doesn't even know it's there. Um, but it has cost. And so I think, you know, when you go to the pump, it's like 25 or 30 cents a gallon is due to the mandatory addition of MBTE, you know, something like that. And there's tons and tons and tons of uses great. And the MA has been rising for many decades. So that, that's a, a massive force. Then you get to trade war tariffs. So Trump slapped tariffs. Yeah, everyone knows Chinese steel, 25%. So basically the price of steel goes up, goes up 25%. Aluminum, I think, was 15%. But then you get Canadian lumber at 10%. You get scotch whiskey. I mean, there's a laundry list of things that are tariffed that either didn't have one before or the tariff went up. Massive increase in prices due to tariffs. Now, Biden, uh, you know, didn't choose to repeal that policy. That policy appealed to him for whatever reason. And so the tariffs are still in place. And of course, Trump is saying if he gets elected, there'll be even more tariffs, 100% tariff on, you know, imported cars and all the stuff. Massive increase in costs to the consumer, you know, due to, due to, uh, to tariffs. And then trade war more broadly. Um, you know, every company that has a supply chain that extends to Asia and especially China is terrified of what the government might do next. Even if today, okay, there's a tariff of X, nobody thinks this is stable. Nobody thinks this is going to be how it is for the next 20 years. So we have to start thinking about onshoring, reshoring, or nearshoring all these different euphemisms for building factories in the U.S., building factories in Mexico, where, you know, labor has gotten so addicted to stimmies that in a lot of cases, people permanently dropped out of the workforce. And so, you know, build a factory here in, you know, the U.S., uh, with what workforce? I mean, even the existing places are, are you know, workers are, are scarce because everybody dropped out. So you have all of that going on. And then finally, you have green energy restrictions, um, which, uh, you know, and you mentioned, uh, you know, net zero. Uh, so I may be getting slightly ahead of uh, topic here. Um, but, you know, just a massive assault on anything that either uses, produces energy, uses energy, distributes energy. Or it uses energy to be manufactured or uses energy to be distributed, which is pretty much everything. I mean, unless you're just going to the guy next door who who whittles a whistle out of a out of a tree branch he found in his backyard and sells it to you at the flea market. Short of that, everything else is either made with energy or distributed with energy. And so if you make energy more expensive, you drive up the cost of everything. Um, now, this has not impacted America nearly so much as it's impacted Europe. And, uh, you know, for a time, you know, like in the UK, the price of natural gas was 15 times what it had been, you know, pre-COVID. Um, so the good news is I don't think there's a ratcheting, certainly not a lockdown or whiplash effects. Uh, I, I think that is what it is. You know, the rise of mandatory useless ingredients, low progression, that's not, I don't think there's going to be like a sudden, for, you know, leap in it, maybe. But I don't see that. Green energy predictions. I think the left is itching to do a lot more, but I think the body politic isn't necessarily on board with a lot more of that right now. Um, and there's a backlash against, you know, electric vehicles, for example. So that may be sort of quiescent. The final thing is that I said, okay, you destroy all these companies in the supply chain and you destroy all these farmers and ranchers. Well, what stops the next guy from borrowing money and jumping into the business, which is what would happen in an efficient market? Well, the thing that stopped it now the interest rate is so much higher. So if all your competitors finance themselves when the interest rates were zero and you're looking at financing yourself at five and a half percent, you don't have a business case until prices have to go a heck of a lot higher. And so, um, you know, the holes in the supply chain, you know, many of them are still there, uh, you know, because of this problem. So if, if one cared only about consumer prices and one were willing to ex ignore the many harms of falling interest rates, and I've written you know, hundreds of thousands of words about all the harms of falling interest rates. But if one was only looking at consumer prices, one should want lower interest rates, not higher interest rates. Um, and um, anyways, I, my theory is not accepted 
in the hallowed halls of the Fed. Then who has my opinion? But um, it's just straight mechanics, right? I mean, if let's say X number of ranchers go offline because of you know they can't they can't weather the lockdown storm, they're just done. And and you're saying, okay, well, I, I want to go into the ranching business. Or you're already in the ranching business, but you want to double your capacity. And suddenly, the cost of, of, of financing that has been hiked from you know zero percent to five and a half percent. Of course, no one's borrowing at the Fed funds rate. They're borrowing at let's say a two and a half percent spread. So the cost goes from two and a half percent to eight percent. Well, how much higher do prices have to be to justify borrowing at eight percent? You know, we may be about to find out if we don't get a crisis before that. This is, I guess, it's definitely a subjective question, and it kind of comes from what you were just talking about there. But I wondered if if um, this whole net zero will continue even amongst crisis types of scenarios. To, to me, because it seems to be political and it seems to be a, a social thing, that the economics probably don't even matter at this point. Would you agree? Do we think? Are we going to see net zero um, kind of proliferate through all the chaos that could be ahead? You know, it's such a really good point, which is the whole purpose of why we, you know, socialize decision making or politicize, you know, so to socialize something is to politicize it, is because it's no longer an economic decision. It's now a political decision. That's not a bug, that's a feature. And, um, you know, an economic decision considers costs as well as benefits, and um, a political decision concerns itself with neither really, but rather um, you know, what the body politic imagines to be the benefits, and the costs are almost always ignored or evaded or uh, you, you know lumped into something else or you know whatever that they do. Um, so it, the question about you know whether it's going to be more green, what I call green energy restrictions, including you know actual net zero mandate. It's just a political question, and I think it boils down to: Does the body politic have any more tolerance for this, you know, rubbish right now? I kind of suspect they don't. I think there's a lot of backlash. Uh, you know, when people talk in theory about, yeah, you know, we as a society should reduce greenhouse, you know, everyone says, yeah, yeah, rah, 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 right. Now, when it's like, yeah, and so we're going to hike up the cost of gas so high that we're going to force you to abandon your suburban home and pile your entire family into a 600 square foot efficiency apartment in the city so that way you don't have a commuting expense anymore well suddenly you know shit gets real and people no i don't i'm not i don't want to be forced to move into the city i thought other people would be somehow reducing their carbon emissions i didn't realize you meant me um you know there was some guy on twitter that tweeted this thing it was a graph of the mass of humans like the, if you add up all the mass of every human you know how many uh you know million you know, kilograms it was, right? Versus like all other animals. And it was like the most horrifying picture. And, you know, I retweeted, it was like, you're looking at a picture of the, you know, the, the ascent of man and saying it's horror. You, you know, what the hell? And the person said, yeah, too many of us, blah, 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 blah. I said, let me guess, you're not volunteering to go first, are you? And, you know, it's, it's a movement that's saying that people are bad. And, um, you know, but everyone everyone hopes someone else will be the one who goes. Nobody wants to be that guy who says, well, I'm going to shoot myself to make everybody else better off, or not even better, other people, but just make Mother Earth better off if we all go. So I'm going to volunteer to go first. No, no one's volunteering to go first, of course. So it's, so it's a political thing. I think right now, I read it, again, this is not in my swim lane, and it's very hard to predict politics, but I read it as a backlash at the moment. Doesn't mean it won't come back in another with another sheet label and in a different guise or whatever, but uh, you know, right now I think people, and then in Europe, much more so, people are pretty pissed off. Uh, you know, how expensive energy is, is rationing. You, know, you can't heat your house above, you know, 18 degrees centigrade or whatever it is, which is fairly cold. Uh, you know, people are pretty unhappy about this. Gold consumption over the last probably two years has been dominated by the BRICS or maybe the Eastern part of the world. Um, my question for you is what circumstances do you think that it could flip and the West reemerges as the world's primary gold consumer? I'm going to say two years. I would say the last eight to 10 months, right? So at the moment, um, you know, gold buying in the U S and you know, in the West more broadly is, is kind of more of it. And it's, you know, it's been trailing down for some time. I mean, at least since 
let's say last June, um, and, and maybe even May or April, maybe almost a year, um, you know, it's been trailing down. And, um, you know, in the big physical markets of the world, let's say China, Turkey, India, and the Arab world. So I'm in Dubai at the moment. I get to see it, you know, up close and personal here. Massive, massive trade in physical, uh, you know, here in Dubai. They have this uh, open open air, you know, it's like a section of the city called the Gold Souk. And on the ground floor, and there's some restaurants and a few other things, you know, the Magdalene Brinks substation. But it's basically jewelry stores selling gold. And, um, you know, most of it, and I sell bars and coins too, most of it is called jewelry. But, you know, in the East, jewelry is money. And, you know, it's very often it's 24 karat gold. It's really crudely cast. It's not about the art. It's not like going to Tiffany's and getting high art that, you know, you're paying 10 or 20 times the value of the gold for the piece. This is heavy, chunky stuff, the whole purpose of which is the weight of gold. And, um, it, you know, the gold souks, they're moving something like two to four tons a day of metal. Um, it was just, which is, this is retail. I mean, this is quite astonishing for, for a retail, uh, you know, thing. People basically fly to Dubai and I don't know if they fly to buy gold as the sole or main purpose of their trip, but you know, they end up buying some gold and then they put it in their pocket and they fly home with it, wherever home might be. Uh, and there's quite a lot of it you know, going on here. Um, but you know, if you look at those worlds and they're quite distinct to separate worlds, um, you have four different drivers, of what's going on, why, why they're buying in China. It's an anti yuan anti Chinese government play. They don't trust the yuan. They have capital controls. They're locked in to this thing that don't want. And, um, but if they have an outlet to buy gold, then they buy gold. Um, in India, it's not hyperinflation. It's just a steady erosive inflation. Um, I think I saw the statistics and rupee goes down 7% a year against the dollar. It's not like the dollar is holding steady, you know, either the dollar has its own, you know, erosion, but this is eroding 7% a year, which is quite a lot against the dollar. And so people just turn to gold. You know, there's no rupee saving plan that anybody trusts or wants, um, you know, necessarily. Um, in, um, in Turkey, there is incipient hyperinflation. It may be hyperinflation, it may not, but you know, it's, it's running much more rampant than in India. It's scary. And, um, I'm told there that everybody who has any degree of wealth at all has at least 10 grams, a third of an ounce. Um, and the average person would have a lot more than it, which is impossible to imagine in America. I don't think one, in the, I don't think one in a hundred Americans has gold. And now here, basically anybody in Turkey who has any money at all has, you know, probably, you know, a minimum, a third of an ounce, the average is probably a couple ounces. Um, you know, wandering around the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, you know, there's so many gold stalls, you know, selling gold. I'm told that there's fewer spice merchants and textiles or whatever, you know, have, have been evicted to make room for more and more gold, you know, vendors. And, and they're going gaga to protect themselves. The Arab world, so anyway, so China is an anti-Yuan play. India is an anti-Rupee play. Turkey is an anti lira play. In the Arab world, you know, some of the Gulf states in particular have uh, currencies that are pegged to the U.S. dollar. And unlike a lot of currency pegs, these are been stable and table flat for decades. Nobody here has to worry, like in UAE, for example, has to worry that the dirham is going to be bad by tomorrow morning. You know, whereas if you live in a banana republic in South America and there's a currency peg, you absolutely do have to worry that that peg is going to snap violently while you sleep. By the time you wake up in the morning, you know, your savings have been cut, you know, third or half or two thirds or whatever. Um, and, you know, I thought the case here, it's been stable for a long time. And when people are buying gold, it certainly isn't because they're worried about either the Durham or, or the other currencies here in the Gulf States, uh, or the, or, or the, um, you know, it's pegged to the, to the dollar. That is an anti-dollar. Like they're very weird of America. And even the ones who like America are certainly in a very right? warm welcome here. And even the ones who like America, and a lot of them do, and you know, they watch American movies, listen to American music, they want to drive. And here in this part of the world, a lot of them do drive American cars. You see F 150s, you know, F 150 Raptors are all over the place, you know. Um, but it, it, even those folks, you know, are conscious, especially the wealthier people, are very conscious of, you know, American military policy and how they're on the receiving end of the stick. 
they're not benefiting from it and they can see how harmful it is. So of, of all the four um, you know, regions that are that are buying gold, that's really the anti-dollar. The anti-dollar play is in the Arab world. Um, and uh, you know, we'll see what happens now. When is this going to reverse? If, if it doesn't happen before then, I think when the Fed um, you, you know, slams interest rates back to zero, I think that will trigger quite a lot of buying of gold in the West. As everyone wrongfully, but everyone's going to think, "Oh my God, inflation is going to you know surge," and actually, it's going to put a damper on consumer prices because businesses will borrow to expand production capacity, um, which is what you want to recover from all the damage done by lockdown and whiplash. But I think it'll be a big spur, at least short term and intermediate term, for uh, for buying gold and, and gold prices. Right. Well, so while while gold hasn't been readily adopted, you see things like Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin gold's move has been pretty significant in historical terms. Uh, but Bitcoin, I think, has tripled off its or at least doubled off its bottom. This leads into my question about CBDCs. How close do you think we are to introducing them into society? And let's let's put it the discussion onto the U.S. You know, as, as with um, net zero policies, it's kind of like, what's the tolerance of of the voters? Okay. You know, are, are people going to just willingly go along with that? Or is, is there going to be a big, uh, you know, outcry? Well, you know, Keith, the only thing I would say is because it seems, I guess the parallel I was trying to make there is that people se- seemingly don't understand necessarily gold and its historical significance yet bitcoin and maybe maybe it's the same divergence maybe there's just more money that's flowing into bitcoin but i almost foresee it from the people that i've talked to and you know guys that i play hockey with they understand bitcoin or they they're at least semi interested in it and even if they don't have they can't buy a full bitcoin they'll buy 0.1 of of a bitcoin um so i wonder if if the introduction is not is like twofold where it's the political ploy to sort of get you out of crisis but whether it will indeed be adopted because people seem to be more linked to it considering where you know social media is where we are as a society well i think and um you know i've become famous or infamous for you know being critical of bitcoin but more on a again a monetary science background I'm not, you know, there's certain prominent forces in the gold community that think, okay, something's bad, therefore it has to go down, or something good, it, it has to go up. And so therefore gold is going to go up more than Bitcoin because gold is good and Bitcoin is bad. And it's like, well, I don't think it works that way. And secondly, how, how do you, I mean, the elephant to the room is Bitcoin hit $70,000 and gold didn't. Um, so, you know, there's something wrong with that theory, but um, the volatility precludes its adoption. That's the problem with it, right? It, the idea of something being money or moneyness, and the idea of something going up or skyrocketing, which is basically volatility, are, are you know mutually exclusive. And so, I, you know, I've, I've pissed off a lot of people, and, and it's not really my intention. I'm just trying to point to you know, certain basically mechanical facts that I don't think should really be controversial. But suppose you're a Ford dealership, getting back to the F-150 Raptor, and you have a fully loaded. Uh, you know, Raptor that you sell to a customer. I suppose you accepted Bitcoin, and nobody really accepts Bitcoin. They just hire a third party, uh, you know, currency exchange who finds a fourth party who has uh, dollars and wants to buy the Bitcoin. And then when you have a customer that has Bitcoin and wants to buy the product, the third party's currency exchange arranges this mul- complex multi party swap, takes a fee, and, you know, essentially the person is selling this Bitcoin to a third party or fourth party right just prior to the moment of sale. And then the, the vendor is getting not only paid in dollars, but he's getting the number of dollars that he sets on his price tag. It's not a Bitcoin price. It's actually a dollar price. But anyway, suppose a Ford dealership took, accepted Bitcoin directly onto the balance sheet. And so suppose at um, you know 10.30 a.m., they sell a loaded F-150 Raptor for $69,000 worth of Bitcoin. And I posted this uh, on a day when Bitcoin had been 69000 in the morning. And then by two hours later, it was like sixty-four thousand dollars. And uh, you know, I mean, that's Bitcoin. That happens, right? And so that everyone says, "Well, zoom out." Okay, but not so fast because if you're a car dealership, you don't get to say zoom out. So you sell the car, take the sixty-nine thousand worth of Bitcoin, which is one Bitcoin. Um, two hours later, the financing manager now is going through, and you have to settle the transactions. 
And of course, the dealership doesn't own the car. All the cars on the lot are financed and you know, fairly typically financed by Ford Motor Credit. So you have to pay Ford Motor Credit. You just sold their car and now you got the cash and you're paying them for it. And then, you know, the dealer makes $150 or whatever, but, you know, a very small amount of money. Less than the move in the Bitcoin price being the point. So two hours later, they have to remit $69,000 to Ford and they only have $65,000 Bitcoin, i.e. Bitcoin, because the price dropped, you know, that much during the interval. So even as a medium of exchange, this kind of volatility is, is just deadly. And then let alone if you're going to use it as a vehicle for finance. Imagine if someone borrowed Bitcoin when Bitcoin was $13,000, which is kind of the low, I think that was about the low on the last crash, you know, two years ago. Um, you know, they borrow it when it's $13,000 and then it goes up a couple of years later to $70,000. Well, that's the equivalent of so what is that, 26 or five times some, you know, it goes up five times. Well, that's the equivalent of, you know, you, you borrow money to buy a house and your house payment is $2,000 a month. And then your house payment goes up to $10,000 a month. Well, how many people wouldn't be bankrupted by this? But, so the, the volatility prevents people from really using it. You can't. It's not usable. And so everyone's buying it because the number go up. Okay, fine. You don't have at it. Um, and maybe the number will go up a lot more. I, I certainly couldn't say that I wouldn't. Um, but, you know, don't, don't kid yourself in thinking that it's being adopted as either, even a medium of exchange, let alone uh, savings, uh, or let alone, um, uh, you know, a vehicle for finance. Now, as far as savings, um, I was invited to debate by the Cell Phone Forum, which is, which is sponsored by the Reason Foundation, and it's run by a guy named Gene Epstein. And, um, yeah, there was a, a gold versus Bitcoin debate, and it was physically hosted by the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. So we're in the big, you know, the big room there, this stage, and I guess the audience, probably a couple hundred people. And um, he were talking about this idea of savings, and uh, my opponent was Pierre Rochard, Bitcoin Pierre, as his known. Um, and, uh, you know, Bitcoin is savings, and I said, okay, well, savings, that means it's suitable even for, you know, would you recommend it for an oxygenarian widow? Somebody who's 85 years old, hasn't passed away, has no further income potential in this life. You know, could, could she put 100% of her savings into it? Oh, absolutely. Now, this is, mind you, the debate occurred a couple of months after that $13,000 drop, or, you know, bottom, it has fallen from, um, you know, what was the 69000 was the previous peak, and it fallen to like 13000 It was like minus 70 percent or something. Right after that, he's saying, yeah, yeah, you, you can put our savings into it. And um, so I said, okay, how challenging is this? Suppose that, suppose if she puts her savings into it and it drops 75%, she's 85 years old. She has to either draw in order to pay the living expenses. What would you say to her falls 75% after she puts her money in? And he got up, and so the, it's it's like Cambridge rules. He gets the final rebuttal because he was on the, the negative side of the proposition. And uh, he says, I would tell her to buy more. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sitting there on the stage listening to this. You know, so there's two chairs, one for myself, one for Ginny, the moderator. And then there's the lectern where, you know, Pierre is, is standing there. And the rules are, I'm not allowed to say anything. I've had my last thing. This is his final, final rebuttal. And I, I just kind of did this, you know, to the audience. And then, and Gene is like, Anna, you know, you're not allowed to say anything. And I'm just like, Anyway, it was kind of funny because, first of all, the supposition was she put 100% of her savings into it. There's no buy more. She can't. And then secondly, that's not what anybody would advise an octogenarian, you know, by any kind of reasonable, prudent standard, anybody with a fiduciary duty would not, first of all, have anybody go all in on something like that. Secondly, to go deeper, you know, when, when it's going down, a psychological tempting for rookie traders, but, um, you know, you shouldn't generally want to say, what are your weeds? What are the flowers of the weeds? Um, so it, it, you can't really use it the way people, you know, suggest it be used. And, uh, you know, as a function of its volatility. Um, looking to uh, precious metals, let's start with gold. Where do you think we end 2024 in terms of gold price? Do you think 2022, are we already seeing the high or are we headed higher? I, I, I think we're headed higher. Um, so, you know, we published this uh, gold market outlook report 
uh, like just about two weeks ago. And, um, you know, one of the hazards of writing something like this, of course, most of the writing I did in late January and early February. And um, so inevitably, one of two things happen. You write that far in advance or something like this. And so you make price predictions, right? Uh, one of two things is going to happen. Either the price is going to reverse itself hard by the time it comes out. You're already wrong in a big way. You look at idiot. Or the price actually moves in the direction that you predicted. And by the time it comes out, you look like you said nothing because the markets are there. Oh, big, big deal. This big guy says, yeah, you know, gold's going to be 2200 and here it is, 2200 What the hell is he talking about? Well, it wasn't 2200 when I wrote that. Um, anyways, I, I think um, the target, I said, I, you know, I, I would expect the price to be north of 2300 by the end of the year. So not particularly excited now. You know, a couple of days ago, we were over 2200 already. Um, so, that, so that already happened. But, um, you know, we're in a bull market now. That's the thing. Um, you know, for many years, right, I mean, the, the price peaked in August of 2011. And, um, you know, for a number of years after that, um, you know, the price would blip and then it would come right back down and, 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 and then some. And so it was just a sell the dip, sell the blips environment. Uh, if you wanted to trade it anyway, I even mean, if you wanted to hold gold, all the, all, all the other reasons, you know, you don't sell it just because the price is dropping. But, um, you know, from a trader's perspective, it was just sell, sell the blips. It, it is what it, it was, what it was. We're not in that environment anymore. We just aren't. Um, I, I think the monetary problems, the monetary disease entered a more virulent phase. I think it's more obvious to more people. There's more buying. Um, the other thing I'll note, right, so we do our analysis at monetary metals, not based on price charts, not based on the idea that past price action can predict future price action, which I don't really fundamentally believe is the case, um, but rather based on looking at spreads, and particularly the spread between price in the futures market minus the price of the spot market. And, um, you know, we've written hundreds of thousands of words to what the theory is, why this makes sense, whatever, but just at a basic mechanical level. So, you know, you see the spread, and this is futures generally, but not necessarily always higher, and, um, you know, spot is, is lower. And if you see the prices rising, so they're both going up together, of course, this, this spread is fairly consistent. Um, and, uh, you know, an arbitrage is holding it that way. But if you see prices are going up and the spread is widening, then that's telling you the buying power that is, is pushing on this, it's pushing on the futures market. And that's very important because, number one, I mean, you can get a lot of price action from action in the futures market because futures will give you 20 to 1 leverage. So it doesn't take that much capital to command an awful lot of notional ounces of metal, um, I mean, which obviously is dangerous, but I mean, that's just mechanically, this is how this works. Uh, and um, number two, because of and just the nature of that kind of trader, it's a short-term thing. So if you see the prices going up and you see, this is the basis spread, future amount of spot is the basis. You see the basis rising in a rising price environment that tells you the driver is a move it's leverage speculators in the futures market. You know that's not doable. I mean, either they're front running something that's real that the rest of the market doesn't know about yet, or usually, and there were so many instances between 2011 and you know 2019 where we just saw this pattern repeat over and over and over again. Price would blip. The gold community predictably would say, break out, moonshot, blah, 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 blah. And then we'd put out an article you know, showing a picture of the basis rise saying, not so fast. Not going to work that way. Um, unfortunately, it is what it is. And, um, you know, we even diagram the half life of, of this blip, you know, go up and come back down. And you can measure it, diagram it. You know, it's like looking at the, the eye of an insect in high school biology, you know, um, you know dissect it and all that. Um, and anyway, uh, that was the pattern every time the price would blip. Well, it's not the pattern now. The pattern now is the price is going up and the basis is not widening which means there's a lot more bond the physical. This isn't Western futures traders getting excited about gold. This is Eastern buyers buying the metal. And of course, that's a different kind of buyer. The guy who's buying the metal isn't you know, in it for a trade of three hours or three days or three weeks. He's taking that metal home, tucking it away in whatever safe spot he's got, and, and it's necessarily coming back to the market. You know, at any predictable time, it's certainly not in day, hours or days. So we're in a different environment and, um, 
that's why uh you know i said um you know over 2300 by the end of the year which at that time uh you know it was more of a run up versus where we are right now we're almost at that what about silver uh silver i think by most expectations hasn't kept up is it the industrial component of silver that has kind of put it in neutral or how do you see silver ending 2024 you know, silver has an industrial component, which, you know, going forward, I, I, I kind of have a negative outlook for, for you know, industrial output generally. I, I think they get into whatever credit event, that, that, that stuff is going to decrease. The problem with silver is, you know, silver and gold are, are both money, but they serve a different, uh, you know, they're different economic properties, they serve a different uh, function. It's not that, okay. Well, silver is for smaller denominations. I think that oversimplifies it. Um, it's that silver is the most marketable commodity. So money is the most marketable commodity, the one with the tightest spread, i.e. the one with the least losses to trade in and out of. Uh, and that's gold. But silver is the most marketable for small transactions. So for wage earners that want to buy 10% of their weekly wages in metal, let's call it $50, $80 worth of metal, you know, skilled blue collar, you know, tradesmen, um, you know, you can buy a, a tiny little chip of gold floating in a plastic window on a certificate card, um, which, which isn't very emotional and satisfying. And you're paying a big markup to manufacture something so small with such precision. Um, or you can buy a handful of silver and, um, which is much more emotionally satisfying. You actually get half to it. You know, it's two, three, four coins. Um, and, um, so silver is, I think, more dependent on the, the fortunes of the wage earners. Gold is a capital asset, as long as there's other capital assets to trade against it. Um, and people can sell real estate, they can sell Picasso, they can sell Bitcoin, they can sell whatever, stocks, obviously, antique Ferraris, um, anything they're holding as a capital asset. And when they sell that, they, they can buy gold, and they do. So um, you see gold you know, making new all-time high prices, and silver you know, 50% off. Or more than 50 percent off not only its recent price peak uh, relatively recent no, to 2011 but 50 percent off the price peak in 1980. um so uh i i do think there's gonna be some gains in the silver price i do think there's a bull market here um uh, but you know i wouldn't necessarily bet on a return to a, a gold silver ratio of uh 30 to 1 as we hit in 2011. Um, as you mentioned, the Monetary Metals uh, 2024 Gold Report is out. We're going to have a link to that in the description. Um, can you tell us more about that report and how Monetary Metals pays a yield on your precious metal? We have a different kind of analysis and kind of different take on things. And um, even, you know, and every once in a while, it's kind of gratifying to see a tweet from somebody who's like, yeah, I totally don't agree with Keith. However, you know, it's often thoughtful. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll take that, you know. We have a very different take on, on things because we're not coming at it from a quantity theory of money, quantity theory of, you know, commitment to traders report. We're looking at spreads. We're looking at other things. Everybody, you know, should at least read it and, and see our perspective on things. Um, we, uh, you know, the actual business, I mean, we're not in the business of publishing reports. The, the actual business is we pay yield on metal. And we do that by leasing it out to productive businesses like refiners, jewelry manufacturers, coatings, you know, companies, fabricators, recyclers, you know, there's, there's about a dozen different verticals where somebody needs gold as inventory or as work in progress. And that inventory is to be financed. So, um, conventionally that let's say you have a million dollars worth of gold inventory, you borrow a million dollars, you buy a million dollars worth of gold, but what do you do? It's the same thing with the Bitcoin, you know, as a Ford dealership, what do you do if the price drops by, um, you know, 10%. So now you have nine dollar asset you still have a million dollar liability you're actually bankrupt and you know you may be in violation of your bank covenants the bank may actually foreclose and take your business away from you um so what you have to do normally is you borrow in excess of that you borrow a million and a quarter buy a million dollars worth of gold put a quarter million dollars in a um brokerage account to trade gold futures with leverage um and that's how you hedge and so if you lease the metal and of course you know it's moving parts of complexity with hedging and that creates risks um, and, as well as costs. So uh, if you lease the metal for monetary metals, it's just a simpler, more user-friendly form of finance, less moving parts, less risk, less cost. 
Um, and uh, of course, anybody getting the finance they need is happy to pay interest, or you know, technically at least uh, for doing so. And um, uh, that's how we pay a yield uh, to the people that own the metal. So we just closed uh, a gold lease at paying three and a half percent to investors, and that's gold on gold, and it's very simple. So if you gave, I give us a hundred ounces in that particular deal. At the end of the year, we give you back a hundred and three point five. Uh, you know, ounces. So um, it's a real return on real money uh, as, as an antidote against, uh, you know, let's just say monetary madness. Excellent. Keith, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, until next time. All right. Thanks so much, Brian. 